All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to John's Gospel, uh, chapter 10. We'll be in the first 10 verses together. Uh, we're continuing to walk through the life and the ministry of Jesus. As we consider what the text says about Jesus, we've been answering a simple but significant question concerning who Jesus is. We're seeking an answer not just biblically or historically, uh, but personally. And as we walk through uh, these testimonies of folks who came into, came into contact with Jesus and the claims that Christ makes concerning himself, the question is, who do you say that Jesus is? Throughout John's gospel, unique to John is seven I am statements, these claims that Christ makes concerning himself. We've already been introduced to two of them. We're going to be introduced to the third of seven. Uh, in John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. In the same way that bread satisfies and sustains physical life, Jesus says, I sustain spiritual life. I will satisfy uh, the deepest longing of your soul. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. If anyone follows me, he shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In a world lost in darkness, Jesus says, I'm the guide. Uh, if you follow me, I will lead you to salvation, to uh, rescue you and deliver you from your sins and bring you to the eternal life that I have to offer you. And then today, the third I am statement, Jesus declares, I am the door. So we're going to talk about what that means in these first 10 verses, but we're also going to answer that question, what does this reveal about Jesus? And then consider our response to that. What do we say about who Jesus is? And so let's go ahead and read the text as we dig into it together. John chapter 10 reads this way, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold, sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice." Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, as we walk through our text, it's important to be reminded of the context of chapter 9. Uh, Jesus in chapter 9 has healed a man who has been blind from birth. Jesus used an interesting method, if you recall, if you were with us, or you've read it before. Jesus uses saliva, mixes it with dirt, and takes uh, what it calls clay and, and begins to anoint this man's eyes. He commands him to wash in the pool of Siloam. He comes back and he sees. This man's testimony is simple but significant. Because of Jesus, I was blind, but now I see. Now, his neighbors, they need to figure out how this happened and who this Jesus is who's healed him. And so they do their own investigation. They don't know where this Jesus is from. So they take the man and they bring him to the spiritual leaders of the day. These are the shepherds of the day. Spiritual leaders are like shepherds. They care for those under their care. They should care for them. They shouldn't lead them astray. That's true for political leaders like David, who is, who is a shepherd to the nation of Israel, or these Pharisees who are the shepherds to the people. They should take care of the people. But as we read, they don't care for this man's spiritual uh, um, um, uh, life. They lead him astray. And, they, and they, instead of celebrating the fact that he was blind from birth and now he sees, if you recall, 
they're not happy with that. They investigate it. And in their investigation, they seek, because it's corrupt, to discredit this man, his testimony, and the one who's healed Jesus. And so it's interesting because this man doesn't even know Jesus. He, he's only been healed by him. And what we learn is this man defends his testimony. Because, I'm blind, because of Jesus, I was blind, but now I see. He defends Jesus, who has healed him, because he says, I don't know who he is, but he must be a prophet. He must be from God. You remember what the Pharisees did to him? They cast him out of the synagogue. They excommunicate this guy. This guy was blind, but now he sees a reason to celebrate, and here they are discrediting him. What kind of a shepherd, a spiritual leader of the children of Israel does something like this? And so what Jesus does in our text, after the man receives sight, not just physically, but spiritually, at the end of chapter 9, Jesus comes to him and says, do you believe in the Son of God? And he says, show me him so that I may believe. And Jesus said, it's me. And he trusts in Jesus. I believe, he says. It's a significant moment. Jesus continues on in his teaching. And what he's going to do is he's going to use an illustration to, to compare and contrast a legitimate shepherd, one who cares for the sheep, with illegitimate shepherds like these Pharisees, like these Jewish leaders, the, the kind of people who are supposed to care for those who are under their care. Instead, these folks are leading them astray because, because they value the word of man over the word of God. They value human tradition over the word of God and the law of God, and they add to it. Because Jesus, if you remember, he just, did, didn't just heal him, he did it on the Sabbath. And these man-made rules and regulations were the very thing that Jesus spoke against as he's exposing the false religion of these Jewish leaders. Now, as we enter the text and, and as we walk through the narrative, in light of that context, I want to first talk about the introduction to the instruction that Jesus gives concerning this illustration of sheep and shepherds and the sheepfold and thieves and robbers who come, legitimate shepherds and illegitimate ones. The introduction to the illustration is significant. He says, most assuredly, I say to you. Now, I don't want to just pass that by because Jesus says this a lot in the John's Gospel. And the reason he says it and speaks this way is significant because he's introducing his instruction as authoritative, as true, and as relevant. First, he's introduced, when he said, most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus is saying, my word is authoritative. When I speak, I speak with authority. Now, Jesus, when he spoke, he spoke with conviction. Even those who came to arrest him earlier in John, if you remember the Pharisees had sent them, they listened to Jesus and they just kind of taken aback and they don't end up arresting him because they say, no one's, no one's ever taught like Jesus. <laughs> He's not like the Pharisees or the scribes of their day. He speaks with authority. Where does his authority come from? He says, most assuredly, I say to you. The reason why he speaks with authority is because he's not just a man or a prophet. He is God. The Gospel of John introduced to us this. In the beginning was the Word. We're talking about Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. So when Jesus says, most assuredly I say to you, He's speaking with the authority because He is God. Not only is he sent by God the Father, he is the second person of the Trinity. He is God. What would happen if we recognized Jesus as God? We would, our ears would perk up. We would come to the word with anticipation and expectation. God has a word for you and me. Yet every time we open this book, individually or in a group setting, in a Bible study, or corporately during the week, are we preparing to hear the authoritative word of God that's relevant and true? It's true as well. It's not just authoritative. It's authoritative it means it's true. Jesus, when he speaks, he's not giving an opinion. <laughs> he's giving the authoritative, true word of God. And so he speaks most assuredly, this is true, as he begins to speak about these things. 
So our ears should perk up. We should respect the words of Jesus. There are a lot of people who didn't agree with Jesus, but they respected him enough to listen. We want to hear what this Jesus has to say, but he also speaks with relevance. This text is relevant, not just to the immediate audience, but every single one of us. When Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, you need to watch out for these illegitimate shepherds and you need to follow the good shepherd, the true shepherd, this text is relevant to every person who can hear this word. Those who are actually there and those of us who get to read the words recorded through the Holy Spirit as John writes this Gospel, it is incredibly relevant. God's word is not outdated and irrelevant. It's living. And as we open the book and we read it, it literally comes alive and changes and transforms us moment by moment and day by day. God's word will not return void. If you're a parent and you take God's word and you share it with your children and you're thinking it's going out one, it's going in one ear, then coming out the other. We're reminded God's word will not return void, but it will accomplish that which God intended for it to accomplish. As you take time to study God's word with a, a spouse or with your family or with a coworker, God's word is authoritative. It's true and it is relevant. And as we open the book and read it for ourselves, how much more should we be sharing it with the lost and dying world around us who is desperately in need of it, who's looking for the abundant life, the kind of satisfaction that only God offers in Christ Jesus. The world will give you a false, counterfeit, abundant life. It will leave you emptier than you came. And as you pursue it, whether it's a career, whether it's finances, whatever it may be, you may climb that ladder and you may reach the peak and you find out you're emptier than where you first began. The abundant life, the contented, satisfied life is only in Christ Jesus, found in the words of Jesus. And so I just want to take some time to to talk about the introduction to the instruction as we're going to talk about this incredible illustration as Jesus makes a revelation, I am the the door. And so who is Jesus? Jesus is the one who speaks with authority, relevance, and truth. That means we should open our ears and we should listen. And let me give us a few takeaways. The the first is, is as we approach God's word, let us approach it with thanksgiving. Um, If you were with us Sunday, we were finishing up Romans, and in Romans 16, at the end, it talks about how the gospel is a mystery. And a mystery refers to that which was previously unknown that has now been revealed. The gospel, the the truth of God's word concerning who Jesus is was revealed partially through the Jewish people, and it's been revealed completely through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God that we have the mystery revealed in its completion. I mean, we have the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ in our time period in the best way possible. I mean, even greater than the, than the oracles of God given to the Jewish people because the revelation of God is full and complete in the 66 books of the Bible as we read God's love letter to mankind. We open this book and praise be to God, we can open it, read it, and learn about who God is and who we are in relationship to him, which is why when you open this book, may we come with an attitude of thanksgiving. Lord, thank you for the words of this book that reflect your very word. We have access to the scriptures in in the best way possible. We have access to good sound teaching and preaching in the best way possible, not just in the local church, but we have access to so much, whether it's podcasts out there that are going on out there, you know, on a good biblical teaching. Now, you have to use discernment when you're going out. Nevertheless, what great access we have in the current time period that we live in Come to the book with great thanksgiving. Uh, Secondly, approach God's word with great reverence, knowing that it is authoritative, relevant, and true. Um, When I'm talking about reverence, I'm not just talking about how you walk around with your Bible and make sure you don't drop it or put a coffee on top of it. (laughs) When we come on Sunday mornings, we, we stand in reverence of the word of God 
But if you stand in reverence of the word of God, but you don't submit in obedience to the word of God, you're not reverencing the word of God. So if we truly reverence, we'll read it, we will apply it, we will see ways our lives, our thoughts, our relationships are misaligned with it, and then we repent and we align with it. When we truly reverence the word of God, it's how we respond to it in reverence and say, God, this truly is authoritative over my life. I don't just want to declare it is inerrant and true. It's relevant, but it's relevant to me. So come to the word with reverence. And then uh, lastly, come to the word with great expectation. Uh, I had mentioned Isaiah 55, 11, it says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God's word will not return void. It will not return void. So continue to invest in it. Continue to share it because every time you read it, it will accomplish the purpose for which God intended for it to accomplish. Let me open it up for discussion. As we discuss the word of God that's relevant, authoritative, and true, uh, what are some recommendations you would give, maybe even in this season of life, that you would say, this is how I get the most out of God's word? Are there certain resources you use? Uh, Is there a certain schedule that you have How do you get the most out of God's word in your current season of life? Maybe it's changed over time. Maybe you say, I'm a morning person, or maybe you say, I'm a night guy. Or maybe you would say, ever since I had kids, when I open up God's word and I teach it to them, man, that's how I get the most out of God's word. Because when I start teaching it, or even in a in in a in a setting where people don't know the word, you really have to buy into the word. So how do you get the most out of God's word? Any any thoughts there, if anyone wants to share? Yeah, Wanda. In the morning, when I get up, it's nice and quiet, so that's when I read my Bible and my coffee. And I use a, it's called Haley's Handbook. Okay. Yeah. So with a cup of coffee, early in the morning, <laughs> and a great resource to use as you do. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, Harold. You know, when you teach, force. Oh, yeah. So there's nothing to challenge your personality. Yeah. 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 As a teacher or preacher of the word, you don't want to uh, teach that what you're living antithetical to or living hip- hypocritically to. And so uh, it's powerful when we teach it. Yeah, whomever we teach it to. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So reading the Bible through from cover to cover and repetitiously makes such a difference. You read it through the first time, you miss some things. Second time, fifth, tenth, twentieth time, there's always more you can uh, continue to get out of it. Such a blessing. Yeah. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, Jesse. That's great. So start your day in the word, end it in the word. If you can't sleep, keep reading the word. <laughs> Let that be what you're dreaming about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
It makes such a huge difference when you commit to however long it is, uh, an hour, a couple hours, depending on the book, and you read it in one setting, you get, get the big picture and you really see the details in light of the, the greater scheme of things. Yeah, so great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always good to hear uh, how you study the word and how others study the word and get the most out of God's word because that's what we want. It's authoritative, it's relevant, it's true. God's word is incredible and we have it right before us. And so Jesus introduces his word like that. He says, most assuredly I say to you. Uh, so we saw the introduction to the, uh, to the, to the um, instruction. Secondly, we see the illustration of the instruction. Uh, as we've said here, Jesus is using a familiar illustration. Now, this illustration may not be familiar to you and me unless you care for sheep, unless we have some um, folks who have raised sheep, but uh, this was familiar to those in the first century. Now, for the sheep that are raised today, sometimes they're used, uh, raised for slaughter. Many of the sheep back then were raised for the purpose of wool and, and using that accordingly, and so uh, you had these shepherds who would take their sheep out, and well, what Jesus is doing here is he's using this familiar illustration to, to, to give us the difference between a legitimate shepherd and an illegitimate shepherd. A genuine shepherd, a good shepherd, um, and a counterfeit shepherd, a shepherd who will lead the, the people astray. And the reason he's doing this is because in light of what has just happened, as we've said, the way that these Pharisees, these, these spiritual leaders of Israel, these illegitimate shepherds, who are not acting like shepherds, should act. Jesus is, is giving us the difference between them. And what he's doing here is, is he's talking to two people. First, he's warning his followers. Jesus is saying, watch out for those illegitimate shepherds. Watch out for those false shepherds, those counterfeits, because they will lead you astray. Uh, whether it's their flattery words, we even talked a little bit about it Sunday, or their smooth talking, we need to watch out for those things. But this is not just a warning to his followers, this is a rebuke to these illegitimate shepherds who are listening. In the crowd are not just the followers of Jesus, the skeptics even, but the Jewish leaders who are listening along. This is a rebuke to them. If you're going to be a shepherd, if you're in a position of spiritual leadership, you can't be leading the people astray. You need to lead the people and care for their souls and draw them to God, not away from God. These folks want to kill God. The second person of Jesus, sent by the Father from heaven to earth to accomplish the purposes that he's been called to accomplish, they want to kill him. These are not legitimate shepherds, they're illegitimate. And this is a reminder that there is a, there is a great qualifications for those who shepherd whether politically or spiritually, as we are called to lead the people closer to God, not lead them astray. And so we begin in verse uh, one as, as, as he describes those who are illegitimate. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. So you want to talk about illegitimate sheep? You want to talk about uh, shepherds? You want to talk about those who are counterfeit shepherds? It says, first and foremost, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door. They don't use the door. If they use any other means of getting to the sheep other than the door, they're not a shepherd. <laughs> and so what we get to see here is they say, if, they, if, 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 if you got the picture of a sheepfold here. Now, sheepfold is kind of like a sheep pen. Now, when I think of a sheep pen, I'm thinking of a of a fence, and then you've got a gate, it opens and closes. That gate has a purpose. That entrance has a purpose. It guards against predators to come in, and it guards sheep from going out. And so in the first century, you had sheep folds, and a sheep fold was an enclosure made of rocks, whether someone put these rocks around it, or they found in the wilderness a natural enclosure, it's kind of like a cave and the entrance was not an actual gate, but what the shepherd would do or the watchman of the gate would do is, is they would function as the gate. They would lie down there so the predators wouldn't come in and the sheep wouldn't come out. If a predator was going to come in and they were going to come in through the gate, they'd have to climb over the shepherd. 
If the sheep are going to leave at night, they're going to have to climb over the shepherd or the watchman who's standing there. Now, in the first century, what they would do, especially if they weren't out in the wilderness and they would shepherd their flocks by day, um, at night they would take their sheep and they would come to a sheepfold and, and there were multiple flocks that would sleep in the sheepfold. So at night they would all go into the sheepfold. There was often a watchman who was watching that. And so in the morning, the shepherd would come. And the shepherd, whom the watchman knows, uh, comes and the watchman allows him to enter through the gate. And what the shepherd does, the good shepherd, is he, he starts to call them out. And he calls them by name. And one by one, he calls his flock out of the mixed flocks. And they all come out one by one. And as he leads them, they follow him. And so Jesus says, if you want to know what an illegitimate shepherd looks like, a counterfeit shepherd, it's one who doesn't go through the gate but goes over the wall or goes in some other way. That's a false shepherd. They climb over the fence and then it says they describe them there here as thieves and robbers. Thieves and robbers. Those are serious words. I mean, Jesus is speaking to the, to the, to, about the Pharisees, the, the, the spiritual religious elites of their day. I mean, the well-respected folks, if you needed to go somewhere to find some answers when it comes to the word of God and the law of God, you go to the Pharisees and these Jewish leaders. They have all the answers. They cross all the T's. They dot all the I's. They're supposed to live a life that is set apart. So if someone knows God, it's these guys, and yet they're not acting like shepherds should act. They're illegitimate. They're counterfeits. And Jesus is basically saying, beware of them. And so first we get to see the counterfeit, the illegitimate, and then he describes the legitimate shepherds. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So who is a legitimate shepherd? One who, who enters by the door. Um, not only does he enter by the door, it says, to him the doorkeeper opens. Why does the doorkeeper open for the shepherd? Because this shepherd is qualified because he is a shepherd. He's legitimate. Now, if he's illegitimate, the, you come to the doorkeeper. The doorkeeper says, who are you? I don't know who you are. Get out of here. And so if you're a robber and a thief, you're going to go in another way. The doorkeeper recognizes the shepherd. And so he recognizes the shepherd, and it says, and the sheep hear his voice. Um, this is not just talking about a shepherd. This is talking about the sheep. Uh, uh, our daughters at dinner tonight, I was telling them the story of how Jesus is, is the door. And I said, you guys are sheep. Did you guys know that? We're sheep. In this illustration, we are sheep. And uh, those who br truly belong to the shepherd hear the voice of the shepherd. When his word is read, our ears perk up because we know the one who cares for us. We know the one who provides all things for us. Uh, even though we walk through valleys, even valleys of shadows of death, you know, he's with us. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't need anything because he's with me. And so the sheep know the voice of the shepherd, the legitimate shepherd. The sheep hear his voice. But not only do they hear his voice, it says he calls his own sheep by name. How precious is that? Not only do his sheep know him, uh, he knows every single one of them and he calls them by name. This is a wonderful reminder for us who are the sheep of the shepherd and part of the flock of God who've been called out of this world into this flock and Jesus led us to salvation and leads us in and out to pasture and provides us all things. He knows us by name. And there are times when we wander. And the Bible even talks about how, how, how Jesus, the shepherd, will leave the 99 and go after the one. And, and as he goes after us, he calls us by name. And so this is a wonderful reminder that Jesus knows your name. Maybe you have wandered in the past and he's called you back and you have come to the shepherd. He's embraced you and he's granted you salvation and he provides you pasture wherever you go. If, you're if you hear him calling your voice, I mean, if you hear, hear him calling your name, come to him. Heed 
his words. And so they hear his name and it says, and leads them out. They heed his words and they follow him. In verse four, and when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And so who is the legitimate shepherd? The shepherd is one whom the doorkeeper knows because he has the qualifications to be a shepherd. What is a shepherd? A shepherd cares for the sheep. If you want to know who the shepherd is, get to know the one who's taking care of the sheep. And the shepherd is not only trusted by the gatekeeper, he's trusted by the sheep. And you get to see the sheep, they hear his voice, they respond to their name being called, and they follow him wherever he leads. I can throw it out to us, you know, are we acting like sheep? I'm not just talking about sheep of any flock. Are you acting like a a sheep of the flock of Jesus Christ so that he leads you and you follow? He calls you by name. And and even when you get in your tough situations, you're walking through valleys and you don't understand. You experience suffering and hardships and painful experiences, but you know your shepherd is with you. He's going to protect you. He's going to pull you back in when you need him. You can trust your shepherd. That's a legitimate shepherd. It says, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. How do you know the voice of a stranger to flee from and the voice of the true shepherd to follow? You simply get to know the voice of the shepherd. There's lots of robbers and thieves in this world that will whisper things and invite us to follow them. But ultimately, those are illegitimate shepherds. Follow the one who will care for your soul, who knows you by name, who will not lead you astray. The thief comes to destroy. And you may follow that path. You may think that it's going to lead to something that will be the kind of abundance you thought was going to be satisfying, and the reality, it leaves you in a terrible place. Destruction and ultimately death, not just physical, but spiritual and eternal. And so, as we consider this illustration, as Jesus rebukes the illegitimate shepherds in the crowd and warns his followers to follow the shepherd, uh, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Jesus is the one who invites us to follow him, who knows us by name and who rebukes those who lead his sheep astray. Who is the shepherd? He is ultimately the protector. And Jesus here in our text, he's going to say in a moment he's the door to the sheep, but he's also in the greater context of this chapter, the shepherd. He is the good shepherd. And so as we draw that, out. Uh, just a couple takeaways. The first is refuse to follow false shepherds by exercising discernment. Ezekiel 34 speaks of those who are illegitimate shepherds. Ezekiel 34 says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. Watch out for those who take care of themselves, but don't take care of their flock. You can usually point out a false teacher, a false shepherd in light of that. You know, prosperity gospel preachers, you know, bring the money to the stage. I mean, they're, I mean they're all these, you watch some of the Christian television sometimes, you, you see the corruption there and they're feeding themselves but not taking care of the flock, not caring for their spiritual needs, not actually preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ and leading the people astray. I mean, watch out for these people. Now, this is a reminder also, if God has called you to shepherd and you're a shepherd, if you've been entrusted a soul to care for then you should shepherd them accordingly and you are accountable to God. That means if you are a husband, you've been called to lead your wife spiritually. You are called, and I am called, to be the spiritual leader of the home who initiates inviting people to come to church. Family, we're coming to church today because uh, we serve the Lord. As for me and my house, I don't know about our neighbor next door, we are going to serve the Lord. 
It's the husband's duty to initiate Bible study among the family and to pray for the children. The husband has the unique role. And so if you're in that, in that role of the spiritual leader, but you're not acting like one, I mean, the challenge there is to be the shepherd. There's a strong rebuke there. If you're a parent, you're shepherding your children. You're leading them closer to the Lord. You don't want to lead them astray or, or cause them to stumble in any way. And so in any way, whether even spiritual leaders within the church, um, whether it's a, a pastor, an elder, or even a deacon, there are qu- high qualifications there. And so first, refuse to follow shepherds by exercising discernment. Secondly, follow the true shepherd. Ezekiel 34, verses 11 to 14 says this, For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they, are, they were scattered on a cloudy and a dark day. Ever been scattered? It says, and I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and in the valleys and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. What you picture there is just a bunch of plump, happy sheep. We're talking about the abundant Life. Why? Because they have no worries. Whether they're going through the valley of the shadow of death or whether they're, they, they find themselves on green pastures, they trust their shepherd. They don't have to go out and, and, and wander in order to experience all the other alternatives because they know the best place to be is in the care of their shepherd. There's plenty of distractions here or there, but they can trust their shepherd. Uh, Let me ask this uh, in light of some discussion. If a fellow believer should come to you and share how excited they are to follow and listen to a new Bible teacher, I mean, they're excited about it, who's teaching, uh, who's teaching, um, how, what kind of questions would you ask in terms of ways they should exercise discernment? We're just talking about any Bible teacher, someone new. Maybe you're attending a new church. What kind of questions should you ask to discern you know, is this a sound biblical teaching or, or is, is this someone leading us astray? You know, you're, you're going through the channels or you're, you're on the, the podcast app and you find a, ooh, this preacher can preach, you know? Uh, let me check them out, but I don't know who they are. What's some questions that you should ask or things that you should listen to when it comes to exercising discernment? Yeah, Dennis. Yeah. Yeah, so where's the authority at? God's word or uh, I, you know, they declare that I've got a word of the Lord for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, who is Jesus? Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he a man? Is he a, a prophet? Or is he truly the Christ, the son of God who offers salvation as a free gift to all who believe in him? Yeah, yeah. who's Jesus? Anything else? This is your best friend coming to you, you know? This is important. They, they need the advice. They, they're saying, please, give me some kind of uh, discerning questions. I, I need some help here. I really like them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so getting into why they seem so captivating and they, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just seeing if it aligned with God, God's word. Uh, you opening your Bible as you as you study it. Sometimes you come to a teaching and they never get to the word. Yeah, it's gonna be a <laughs> difficult place to be. I'm ready to open my Bible. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Sure, sure. So do they twist the word? Do they, uh, teach a te- they, they, do they teach a subject and then use proof text? Or is the text the main, uh, the main thing and then you have uh, other things to go around that? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if this is right, but I guess I would say what kind of outreach program do you have? Sure. Yeah. 
Sure, sure. So the fruit therein, I mean, what kind of uh, fruit is being born out of the ministry or out of the, uh, out of the church or the teaching and preaching therein? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's important, right? You, you go to a Christian bookstore or you go online and you see all the top Christian books. Man, you take a look at a lot of those and you really get into them and you consider some of the authors. There's some folks that lead you astray, you know? And so it's important. I mean, these discerning questions are things that we should ask and we should uh, be discerning and we don't want to be led astray. We want to follow the shepherd. And the key to, to knowing how to follow the shepherd and to discern those who are not is simply by knowing his word as, as we get to dig into it. Absolutely. So uh, first we saw the introduction, uh, the words of Jesus as he presents his instruction is authoritative, relevant, and true. The illustration, we see the difference between a legitimate shepherd and an illegitimate shepherd, one who doesn't have the qualifications to be a shepherd, even though they're functioning as one, but they're leading the people astray like the Pharisees in this group who, whom Jesus is rebuking and warning his followers from continuing to follow any longer. And then now thirdly, we see the confusion, verse six. It says, Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he, he spoke to them. Not confusion. You can open up the Bible, you can read it, and you can study it, but if you don't understand what it says, I mean, what's the point? Um, when it comes to confusion, when it comes to God's word, and, and you're seeking, Jesus, who are you? Even as Jesus is instructing them, uh, the Bible says, if you seek me and you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And so if you find yourself confused and continuing to wrestle with who is Jesus, not just biblically and historically as we read it, but personally, do I agree with this book? Do I, do I agree with the words that are spoken? Do I really believe God's word is authoritative, relevant, and true? Is it truly the, the, the means by which I should, the, the, that which should rule my life, the way I think, the kind of relationships I have? You know, is God's word what it is or not? And so we seek out the Lord and discover those things for ourselves and um, if you ever find yourself, I'll open up for discussion a little more, uh, folks that you get to minister to who are not there yet. Uh, I was talking to my daughter. She's five years old, just turned five, talking to her about Jesus and sharing the gospel with her and, and saying, you know, are you ready? And, she's, and she told me on the way to school this morning, I'm, you know, I'm still wrestling with this thing, you know, this Jesus thing. Um, how do I know if, if, if I'm ready to say the prayer? What do I say when I say the prayer? And I say, oh, you will know, you know. We talk about it, we, we discuss it, but you'll know when it's, when it's time that you really trust and believe in Jesus. As you minister to, to folks, whether it's your children or, or some coworker or a neighbor down the street, how do, you, how do you chat with guys like that or gals like that? Any neat conversations lately you've had. Yeah, Harold. We see where he's at, yeah. Yeah. Any others? Got any family members you chat with or folks you discuss these things with? I have a gal that's painting my fence outside. Yeah. Yeah. 
So lots of superstition in it. Uh, it's religion, but lacks a genuine relationship with Christ. Yeah, yeah. Just chatting with folks like that and, and praying for those folks. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, Jesse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's neat to think through these things. I mean, I, I, I pray you're having those conversations with those around you and thinking through just how to, how to continue to encourage them and turn those, those conversations to spiritual things and, and encourage them in the Lord and uh, uh, confusion. And then uh, as we continue to navigate the text, we see the, the revelation, verse, six, verse seven. Excuse me, it says, Then Jesus said to them again, he introduces his, his word again as authoritative, relevant, and true. Most assuredly, I say to you, if you weren't listening before, open your ears. Open them with anticipation and expectation because if you've been wanting to know who Jesus is, he's about to tell us. If you miss the fact that I am the bread of life who, who sustains and satisfies your spiritual life. If you missed his second I am statement, I am the light of the world. I'm the guide. If you've been fumbling around in the darkness trying to take hold of this religion or that philosophy or, or, or this false thing, then, then come to me. Jesus goes on to say, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door to the sheep. I am the door to the sheep. Right, the door is significant and the reason is because it serves as a protection to the sheep. It protects the predators from coming in and the sheep from going out and being led astray. Verse 8, all whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Anyone who claims to be the door other than Jesus is a thief and a robber. If anyone should Say, I am the door that leads to salvation. I am the door that leads to abundant life. They are not the true shepherd. They are an illegitimate shepherd, and they will lead you astray. Whether it's a false teacher, whether it's your career, whether it's relationships that take the place of God, whatever you pursue that should be God in the place of God is ultimately an idol. And Jesus is saying, thieves and robbers have come before me. We're talking about false teachers who have come. We're talking about those who are Pharisees, who are leading the people astray. And these are thieves and robbers. They're seeking to take that which belongs to the Lord and lead them astray. And God takes that seriously. If you are the sheep of his flock, he will protect you. He'll provide you for you. He leads you to salvation and he leads you to everlasting life. Take a look at verse 9 that clarifies that I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Now, if we're thinking completely, um, what, what, uh, if we're not thinking in terms of, of salvation spiritually, but just physically, Jesus is talking about salvation from any predator that should come whether a thief or a robber or even a predator, but we know when Jesus says, I am the door and I lead to salvation, he's talking about salvation unto eternal life. Jesus is our great protector. He's our, our shepherd. He'll provide for us. He is the gate. And if a false teacher should come and try to lead you astray, he will call your name. You'll hear his voice and he'll lead you in the path of salvation and provision, everlasting life. He's our protector. What a wonderful thing. Um, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus says, I am the way to salvation. If any other buddy claims to be the door, that's a thief and a robber. If anyone says there's some other way to get to heaven, your works or some false religion, 
this or that, that will lead you astray. And Jesus says, I'm not just the way to salvation, I'm the way to provision. He leads us to green pastures. Oh, it brings us back to Psalm 23. You can't get away from it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't need anything. He leads me to the green pastures I need to go to. Uh, He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. Uh, uh, Everything I need, I have in him. And then verse 10 includes this way. It says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The thief only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Why do we take doctrine seriously, especially when it comes to sound doctrine? Because if you are led astray, it only results in that which is seeking to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It's so important we know the word of God and we follow the voice of God who calls us by name and cares for us as sheep of his flock. Why? Because he loves us. He wants to protect us from the thief who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Even though they may seem like very nice people, they might be your neighbor, they might be a family member who says, you know, we're looking out for the best for you, but God wants to protect you because the thief only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. In John chapter 20, verse 31, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What kind of life are we talking about? We're talking about the abundant life eternal life, the forgiven life. Now, when we're talking about abundant life, are we talking about long life? And some people, when they think of abundant life, I want to live long on this earth. When you think of the abundant life, maybe you're thinking, my storehouses are full. They're overflowing. I mean, I take a look at my bank account. I mean, passive income, if you know what that is, it keeps coming in. Maybe when you think of the abundant life, you think of your family, your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. You know what the abundant life is? The abundant life is not longevity and long life on this earth. It's not even all the money in the bank account that you could imagine. It's not even your health or your happiness. The abundant life is contentment and satisfaction in the shepherd who leads you and guides you. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't need anything. I may not have any money in my bank account, I may have a terminal illness and I don't have much time left to live, but I have satisfaction in knowing that he is my shepherd and he will lead me and he will guide me. I have nothing to worry about. That is the abundant life. And did you know the abundant life doesn't begin after we die? The abundant life begins now. So do you know the shepherd? Do you know Jesus who says, I am the door to the sheep. I'm the protector. I'm the way to salvation and provision. I will lead you to everlasting life. Well, we're talking about salvation. Sometimes we, we lose sight of, of, of things in light of the, our spiritual talk or Christianese. You know? No one needs to be saved unless they need to be rescued. We are sheep desperately in need of rescue. We find ourselves in the pit of our own depravity. We don't even know that we're in this pit until the shepherd comes and calls us out and even gives us the desire to come and follow after him. And he calls us to this abundant life in him. So let me conclude as we conclude each week. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Not just biblically or historically, personally, who is Jesus? Is he the door to the sheep? Is he the door that has brought you to experience salvation and provision, who cares for you and takes care of you, and you don't need anything because he's leading you? Is he the one you hear, and when you hear his voice and you hear the call of your name, you follow him because you know he's your shepherd? And when you hear these 
false teachers, these illegitimate shepherds who whisper your voice, you don't follow because you know who is your shepherd and you follow him. And do you, have you experienced the abundant life? Because if you're a believer and a Christian and you haven't experienced the peace of God that transcends all understanding in Christ, it's already yours. We have the peace of God that transcends all understanding and we get to enjoy it in our personal relationship with Jesus. Can we pray? Father in heaven, uh, what, a, what a wonderful reminder of what it means to be the sheep of your flock. What a wonderful reminder to know that you are our shepherd and we don't need anything. Though we may be find ourselves in green pastures or we may find ourselves in valleys. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, we can trust you. Father, we know that you care for us. You take care of us. You will protect us from anyone who would lead us astray or any predator who would come, the thief who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Father, help us to enjoy the abundant life that we have received in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. And Father, as we have opportunities to talk to those who may be confused, who perhaps haven't heard the gospel of Jesus or who are still trying to figure it out, help us, Father, to speak the right words to them. Guide us and lead us in terms of what it looks like to to pray for them and, and engage in conversation about you with them. Father, even if there's someone who's still wrestling with the truth of who Jesus is in our study, I pray, Father, that you would make it abundantly clear of who Christ is and that they would trust in you as as their Savior and as their Lord. And as the blind man who was born blind and received physical sight, but also spiritual uh, spiritual sight said, I believe. Father, we thank you for these things. We give you thanks for them, and we pray your blessing as we close up this week. In Jesus' name, amen.